What I want to talk about in this lecture is extending our concept of functionals to um, those with multiple dependent variables. So thus far, u has been our only dependent variable. Now I want to allow there to be a u1, a u2, all the way up to un. So something with n dependent variables. Um, so, so let me uh, kind of just remind you of what we focused on thus far. So we focused on a single dependent variable u so far. And, and that functional took the form of, remember, i of u is equal to the integral from a to b of f, uh, which is a function of x, u, and u prime. This is our kind of the one we initially developed. We'll call that equation 1. Okay. Now let's consider a functional with multiple deep, uh, dependent variables. So what does that look like? It looks like i uh, is going to be a, a functional of u, and I'll put a subscript i there to remind you that there's multiple u's here. And that's going to look like integral from a to b of f, and now we have x and u1, u1 prime, u2, u2 prime, up to uh, un, and then un prime, right? dx, call that equation 2. And I'll remind you that uh, obviously the u1, u prime, u1 prime, u2, u2 prime, all of these are functions of x in themselves. Okay? So just like we did when we were developing the solution for uh, uh, equation 1, we're going to begin by assuming that the boundary terms are all specified at x equals a and x equals b. And we're going to assume that for each u, uh, u of i, where i goes from 1 to n, okay, and what that's going to give us is it's going to say that the variations of those um, uh, functions are going to be 0 at the endpoints, right? So we have then the delta u1 evaluated at a is equal to delta u1 evaluated at b is equal to delta u2 evaluated at a uh, equal to delta u2 evaluated at b equals dot 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 and then up to delta un evaluated at a is equal to delta un evaluated at b which is all equal to zero right that's what it means with the boundary terms are specified let's call that equation three okay so we already know how to extremize the functional so we take the first variation and set it equal to zero and so we end up being able to write then the delta i equals zero and what's delta i if we go up to equation two well we, just like we've done before we're going to use the chain rule with our with our um, uh, delta operator and so this first term becomes partial f with respect to u1 delta u1 plus partial f with respect to u1 prime delta u1 prime uh, plus partial of f with respect to u2 times delta u2 plus partial of f with respect to delta uh, with respect to u2 prime times delta u2 prime uh, plus dot 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 uh, uh, partial of f with respect to uh, un uh, times uh, delta un plus partial of f with respect to un prime times delta un prime right that whole thing integrated over dx, right? Call this equation 4. So we can write 4 in a more compact form just using a summation notation. And in that case, we could just write then that the integral from a to b of the sum now from i equals 1 to n of the quantity partial f with respect to ui uh, times delta ui plus partial f with respect to ui prime, delta ui prime, right? That quantity, uh, uh, this all integrated over dx is equal to zero. Let's call that equation five. Okay, there's, so the, the, this is equivalent, right? Uh, four and five are equivalent, but there's nothing special about having the summation inside the integral, so I can pull the summation outside the integral, right? When I do that, I end up with the sum from i equals 1 to n 
of, I'll put it in brackets here, now the quantity for integral from A to B of uh, partial of F with respect to UI times delta UI plus partial of F with respect to UI prime times delta UI prime uh, dx, close brackets, is equal to zero. Call that equation six. Okay, hopefully this is seeming familiar to you now. What I want to do is I want to integrate this second term in the integral by parts. And when I do that, I have this summation term, sum from i equals 1 to n, and then my bracket. That first term remains unchanged, so I'm left with integral from a to b of this quantity uh, partial f with respect to ui, right? And, and then there'll be a minus d by dx term, uh, partial f with respect to ui prime. Okay, that whole quantity times delta ui uh, dx, right? So there's an integral term. And then I have a boundary term plus uh, what will be the partial of f with respect to ui prime times uh, delta ui evaluated from a to b. Okay, all of that equals zero. Let's call that equation seven. Okay, if, if you don't remember how to get from step six to step seven, then just go back to the lecture on uh, when, we, when we did it for equ equation one. It's the same process. We're just now doing it for, for all the I values. So where do we go next? Well, remember equation three, which said that all the variations at the boundaries, so all the delta UI at the boundaries were equal to zero, right? And we, we uh, achieved that by, by saying that the dependent variables u were all defined on the boundaries, okay? So because boundary condition, uh, boundary values are specified, equation three holds. And the upshot of that is that this last term in the summation, then that means that these all delta UI terms are zero, so this term goes away, okay? So the last term in the summation is identically zero, and I probably should close our bracket here so I can actually define where the summation ends, okay? So what are we left with when we, when we have that is just this first term. So the sum from i equals 1 to n of the quantity uh, integral from a to b of partial of f with respect to ui minus d by dx partial of f with respect to ui prime. Okay, let's put parentheses around that. Times delta ui uh, dx. All of that is equal to zero. Call this equation eight. Okay, so what can we say now? Well, equation eight has to hold for all admissible variations of delta ui. Okay, so, so what does that mean? Because equation eight must hold for all these admissible variations of delta ui, that means that every i term, so every, every uh, pick a value of i, every quantity then in the brackets um, must be identically zero. Okay, and if if you're saying, well, I don't I don't quite understand why that would be. Um, just let's if if we want to pick an admissible variation, let's let's choose um, let's choose i equals one for example. And I decide to choose my admissible variation uh, for uh, delta u two through delta u n all to be zero. Then this equation recovers back to equation one, and I can apply the apply the fundamental lemma. I could do that for i equals two, i equals three, I, all the way up to i equals n, and I, I so I'm I'm able to separate those out in that way. So what we can do is we can then invoke the fundamental lemma of variational calculus uh, to arrive at a system of Euler-Lagrange equations. And so it's it's pretty simple to see what that looks like. That just means that our system is now partial f with respect to ui minus d by dx of partial f with respect to u i prime, right? That quantity must be equal to zero uh, for all i is equal to one, two, up to n, right? We'll call that equation nine. Okay, so what is this saying is that, that um, if we have a functional of n independent variables u, then it results in a system of n Euler-Lagrange equations that must be satisfied. 
Okay, so I think in the course of of this derivation, we, we ended up with a result that I could have just given you, but it, fall, it flows naturally from it. So um, hopefully now you see that if we have multiple dependent variables, um, at least the, the Euler-Lagrange equations aren't, um, aren't too uh, complex to develop. I tell you what will become complex is uh, it may not be very easy to solve that system of equations, okay? So uh, that, that of course, depends on what comes out of those, those equations. But, but uh, developing them uh, is, a very, is a very straightforward and, I think, uh, intuitive um, uh, solution.